Welcome everyone. Uh, we're just going to give people a couple of minutes to enter. Um, so we will uh, just sit here and allow people in. We've got a huge number of attendees, a huge interest in this event and Bob and Shailen's book. So uh, let's just wait until we get as many people in as possible, then we'll kick off properly. For anyone who's just joined, we're just uh, pausing while we let uh, more people in. Uh, huge interest in this event, and we'll just allow people to join. I'm kicking off in a minute or two. Join us. We're just going to give it a minute or two before we start uh, to allow as many people in as possible before we kick off, uh, starting in a couple of minutes. Excellent. So let's uh, let's make a start. Uh, welcome everyone to this book launch event on its UK publication day uh, for The Upswing by Robert Putnam and co-author Shailen Romney Garrett. Uh, I'm Bobby Duffy. I'm director of the Policy Institutes at King's College London and chair of the Campaign for Social Science. And it's my absolute pleasure to be chairing this event uh, today. It really couldn't be better timed uh, to have such expert insight into the US. Uh, I think after the last few days, uh, I think we feel we all need it uh, right now. Uh, this is a joint event between the Campaign for Social Science and King's College London as part of King's program during the SRC's Festival of Social Science um, and supported uh, by Sage Publishing. Uh, the festival kicks off properly uh, at the weekend so it's worth looking at, at the Festival of Social Sciences programme. Uh, and this is an early taster, uh, and what an event to have as uh, an early taster for that festival. Um, the Campaign for Social Science is a key part of the Academy of Social Sciences, um, which brings together over 90,000 social scientists, uh, including over 1,400 fellows, uh, 46 learned societies as members. Uh, and we have just one purpose really as a campaign and that's to promote the vital role of social science in improving decision-making society and lives. An important part 
of social sciences contribution in that is understanding the real underlying trends in how societies are changing and why. And the upswing, which I've enjoyed hugely as a book, is a brilliant example of that in action, taking a longer view of how the US got to where it is now and thinking about what comes next. Um, the Kirkus Review in the US calls it tour de force and a top notch addition to the why America is in such a mess genre. Um, it's a great uh, uh, recommendation for it. Um, so we're going to hear from Bob and Shailin in just a second, and they'll take us through the main arguments and evidence from the book, uh, the innovative use of evidence that they've employed uh, in around 25 minutes. Uh, and then we'll have responses from our excellent panel, and I'll introduce in a second, and then plenty of time for questions uh, from you in the audience, um, which we'd like you to submit through the Q&A function that you hopefully you'll see on your screens, not, so, not the chat function, but the Q&A. Uh, function and given that we've got so many people uh, do submit uh, your questions early so clearly the US election provides a hugely important context for this but this is not an election analysis uh, session it's about uh, longer term trends I, I think a lot of us will be glad after 48 hours of non-stop watching of CNN um, that we take a broader view here uh, so do submit your questions on the themes in in the book and, and that we'll be exploring here uh, do tweet away as we go through, um, hashtag, just to keep it simple for now, is the upswing, uh, if you're using that. Um, and I think that's it in terms of uh, uh, practical intro. So it's just down to me to introduce um, the panel properly. And then we can just go seamlessly from Bob and Shailen's presentation to those uh, responses. So first of all, Robert Putnam is a political scientist and is now Professor of Public Policy at Harvard University, which is the latest role in an illustrious career that's included Dean of the Harvard Kennedy School uh, and receiving some of the highest awards available in the US and globally for political science, for humanities and for interdisciplinary research. And of course, he's the author of many award-winning books. Um, Shailen Romney Garrett is a co-author on the book and is a writer and award-winning social entrepreneur. Uh, she's founding contributor to Weave, the Social Fabric Project, which is a, an Aspen initiative. And then we'll have responses from a brilliant panel. Um, first of all, from Professor Jennifer Rubin, who's Executive Chair of the SRC and Professor of Public Policy at King's College London. Uh, and then uh, Lord David Willits, who's President of the Resolution Foundation, of course, uh, former Minister for Universities and Science. So that's it in terms of introduction. I think we go straight over to Bob and Shailin to take us through uh, the upswing. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Bobby. It's um, an enormous pleasure for me and Shailin to be here uh, with you. Um, it's an added bonus that there seems to be a special attention to American history and where we're going uh, in these days. But we want to begin, at least at the, at the beginning, we want to focus not on what's happening in the last day or two, but what's been happening in the last 125 years to get kind of a running start on the general uh, trends in America. Um, as, and, and we'll see that the current period um, takes on a special interest and special meaning if you get, if you zoom back and get a much wider perspective than just the last several weeks or months or even the last several years. Um, can we have the next slide? Um, the, what the, the, um, the setting point for this uh, question is that um, America has now reached um, historic levels of, <laughs> Americans are really, all Americans are upset about what, where we've reached, historical levels of economic inequality um, and historic levels of political participation, which have only been, uh, that our levels of political polarization have been increased even in the last several days, as you'll all be aware. Also, historic levels of social isolation. And finally, historic levels of cultural individualism, focus on um, me and not we. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. And the question that we want to uh, address in this book, we do address in this book, is um, how did we get here? Um, as a prelude to 
figuring out, well, where, how can we get out of this awful situation? But um, I'm going to be speaking mostly now about the quantitative evidence that leads us to say um, that, um, that basically sustains the, the claims made in this first slide. Um, and I'm going to be talking mainly about the data, the rough division of labor between me and Shailin is that um, I'm going to be talking mostly about the hard numbers and focusing on the social science of it. This is appropriate for this particular uh, venue and audience. And then Shailin will offer what is in some respects even more interesting, which is the, the narrative that ties it all together. So if we have the next slide, um, I'm going to start on evidence and I'm going to be showing actually the real evidence that underlies these larger claims. Here, for example, is one example of the evidence that we that leads us to say that American um, income inequality today is uh, today at a very um, low level, low level of income inequality. Um, if you start over on the right hand side of these of this chart um, and take, for example, the blue line, um, you'll see that at the at the beginning of the 20th century, um, our data here begin in 1913, because that's when America first had an internal revenue service that kept records of people's income. Um, America's income was very, very unequally distributed. It was what is called in American historiography, the Gilded Age, big gap between rich and poor. And then that gradually, you can see from that low point began to improve still very, very far from perfect income equality, of course, but gradually becoming less unequal, more equal. There's a little pause during the 20s, as you can see there, but then it rises up steadily uh, through the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, into the middle 70s. And then suddenly that line declines and begins to sharply um, income inequality increases, income equality decreases, and you can see that these numbers are continuing to go down to the present day. The number here stops in just for data reasons in 2014, but we know that that number has continued to plunge um, over, the last, um, over the last six or seven years, and, in, and even in the last year, uh, income equality has been uh, gotten a lot worse. Um, and the two different lines there, or the upper line, shows income equality after taxes. The, the uh, lower line shows income equality uh, before taxes. And you can see it doesn't much matter which of those two measures you use. The basic, I mean, of course, there's a difference. After taxes, income is a little more equal than before taxes. But the trend line is essentially identical. If we have the next slide. I'll give another example of the kind of evidence we use. Here, we use as ev here we're looking at the degree to which um, there is upward mobility, there's been upward mobility. The, the degree to which people from lower in the economic hierarchy have a chance to move upward. It's what sometimes in America call the American dream. Can you do better than your father or mother did in terms of your, your economic, um, your, your, your lifetime income? And you can see here the graph begins in about 1945 or 46, 47. And you can see that that graph, uh, the generation who came of age in 1945 um, was reasonably, uh, had a reasonable chance, as you see, the, the generation that comes of age in 1965 is even greater, almost, I would say almost perfect income equality in the sense that 100% of the, well, 95% of all American kids were earning more than their parents. But then this line measuring upward mobility begins to go down and it's pretty steadily down, 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 down. And by the time you get to our times, uh, barely half of kids are earning uh, more than their parents did. In other words, half kids are, aren't, aren't earning as much as their parents uh, did. And again, this graph, if we continue the numbers uh, more recently, it would continue to go down. Let's have the next slide. Um, and now I'm moving, not, I'm moving from the measure of economic, uh, of economic inequality to a, what seems to be a quite different issue, which is um, polarization. And we're going to see basically a similar pattern, but here we're measuring the degree to which there is cross-party collaboration. And again, I'm going to be using a couple of specific measures. In the book, we have many different measures of cross-party collaboration or of, of, um, of political polarization or political comedy, whichever you want to label it. And you're going to see that all of these independent measures, they all show the same story. 
this particular measure is a measure of the degree in any given year, to what extent was there collaboration in the national legislature, the House and the Senate, across party lines? And uh, to get over to the very far right at the moment, I mean, I've got to get to, I've got to come back to that, but at the very far right, that the very far, the other end, sorry, look at the other end of the chart over there where we are now, you'll see that that's, that is approaching a perfect uh, polarization or perfect, uh, the absolute numerical low point of cross-party collaboration, because as you will have known from the newspapers now, in any given vote in the, in the Congress or in the Senate now, essentially 100% of, of Democrats vote one way and 100% of Republicans vote the opposite way. Um, that would seem classically a kind of Westminster model in which all members of one side of the house go out one door and all members of the other side of the house, the House of Commons go out the other side of the door. That's been extremely rare in American history. We have a very different kind of political system, but we're now approaching Westminster levels or classic Westminster levels of party discipline. Let's go over to the other, let's begin over now, go back to the beginning in, in around 1890. You can see then too, American parties were, were very divided. There was very little cross-party collaboration in uh, around 1890, 1900, the era that we earlier called the great, the, um, the, uh, the Gilded Age, that was also an age of extreme party um, uh, polarization. In, but then again, beginning in around 1910, you see American parties, be, there began to be somewhat more collaboration across party lines. Um, and that, that measure of the degree to which people from different parties nevertheless were able to find common ground, in this case in the US Congress, that rises steadily from uh, through the 20s, through the 30s, through the 40s. It's high, of course. You might say, of course, during World War II, uh, but it actually continues to be high, just about as high into the 50s and into the 60s, and then begins to decline, actually, and then the, begins to decline rather sharply at the end of the 60s. And now, um, and this is the part of the story you've heard about, America, how American parties are becoming more polarized. That graph is simply the evidence that fits, fits with the, what everybody now knows that American parties are very polarized. And by this measure, that polarization has gotten greater and greater so that now our parties are much more polarized than they were at the beginning of this uh, period. Um, if we have the next slide, um, there's another, this is another measure of, of um, party polarization. The point methodologically of this study is that we try to use many, many different measures uh, to see if they all cohere. And you're beginning to see how much they do all tell the same story. It makes us confident that the story is right because it doesn't matter exactly what measure you use. In this case, we're trying to measure party polarization. And one measure of that that works very well in America is the degree to which a given citizen votes for one party for Congress and a different party for the president. That would indicate that there are a lot of people, when that's high, there are a lot of people who are um, uh, uh, splitting their, voting for one party for president and a different party for, the, uh, for their congressman, a congressperson. As you can see, that basically follows exactly the same pattern. And again, if we had um, the, uh, the full data, even to, to this year's election, the number, the amount of split ticket, vote, split ticket voting, that is the degree to which a Democrat say voted for a Republican for Congress or vice versa, that is now back down to almost zero. Let's have the next slide. Um, and the next slide I think goes to a third dimension, a third. So what I've said so far is by many different measures, America has become less equal, less, uh, more polarized, and here we're turning to a third dimension of how American society is put together. This is a measure of the degree to which we're, this is one measure of this third theme of social connection or social isolation. This is a measure of the degree to which people are active in mem membership in civic organizations. This chart actually happened to appear in a book I published uh, 20 years ago called Bowling Alone. Um, and and as, as it was true then, of course, it's, it, the data still are the same. You can see Americans were not very active in civic organizations around 1890, 1900. But then you begin to see a familiar pattern now, um, increases in 
began in the 20s and the 30s and there's a bit of a pause during the Great Depression. That's probably, that's when the Great Depression caused people to hunker down. But then coming out of the Great Depression and especially during and after World War II, a huge increase in the number of Americans who belong to organizations. And then in about 1960 or 65, 1970, that begins to plunge down, keep going down. Uh, at pause at 2000 because it, no, pause at 2000 because at 2000, that's when Bowling Alone was published. And it turns out now, if you continue the data gathering over the last 20 years, it's essentially continues exactly the line that we described, that I described in Bowling Alone. Let's have another measure, however, of social connection. If the next slide, this is membership in church organization, in church, membership in churches. Um, I won't go on to great detail about religion in America, except to say that in America, about half of all social capital, that's the label, my jargon for this, about half of all social capital in America is religious. And therefore membership in churches is a particularly good measure in America, and wouldn't be true in the UK, of the degree to which people are connected to their friends and neighbors. And again, you see a very similar pattern. Starting in 1890, Americans were not very active in, in, in church organizations, but then beginning in 19, uh, again, the same pattern, basically in the 1910s, 1920s, rising, sharply after World War, uh, during and after World War II, sharp increase from 1950, 1960. And then almost at exactly the same middle 60s, that turns around and, and church membership has begun to plummet over the last 50 years, as you can see. Let's have another measure of the way to which we're connected. Another measure is actually the smallest unit of social connection might be the family. And many different measures show that the um, trends with respect to family formation. Here's one measure of that, which is the degree to which people are married. You can see that people, um, uh, whether you talk about people who've ever been married, um, that's the top line, or people who are currently married um, as a number, as a fraction of, of prime age adults. Again, you say the same, and now I won't go through the detail because it begins to get boring. Um, low at the beginning, lots of bachelors and, and spinsters, as they were called back in 1900, but then beginning in the 1940s, sharp increase up to 1960. That's the baby boom. Uh, that's the parents of the baby boomers. And then be, you begin to see right after 1960, a long steady decline in, in the marriage rate. Uh, if we have the next slide. Um, and this is finally, I won't go through the detail, but this is finally a measure of generational differences in social trust, which is a kind of a general summary of the degree to which Americans have felt connected or not. And again, if we had time where I could go through in detail, you see that that hits its peak with a generation who's, who came of age in the 60s and then has been a, there's been a sharp decline in subsequent generations in the level of social trust. Young people today, and this is widely known, don't trust other people as much as, as people did 30 or 40 or 50 years ago. Next slide. Um, lastly, I wanna use just a couple of quick uh, measures of the degree to, of what we call culture. Culture is a very hard thing to measure. And actually, I'm kind of proud that in the, in the case of culture, we have a number of different measures. I'm going to show you two or three here because culture seems like a very mushy idea. And how could we possibly be measuring something as mushy? And one, one technique that we're using, um, it's, it's well known among specialists, but it's, I think, novel to many, even lots of other social scientists. And that is a, a um, takes, uh, is rooted in the fact that um, Google now has um, digitized all, all books ever published, actually all books ever published in the world, but we're focusing here on America. So here we're looking at long run trends in um, the use of particular words in all American books. It's all books. It's not academic books. In fact, it's mostly not academic books. It's cookbooks and crime stories and gardening books and, and uh, children's literature and so on. So it's a measure in general of what Americans in any given year uh, are writing and reading. And for just to, for a second to give it a sense of how this works, if you look over time at, the, at a very common word like the, um, the frequency of the word the over this whole period, indeed over most of American history, is the graph is completely flat. There's America, American literature doesn't have any more and writers and readers are not using or listening to the word the any more now than 20 or 50 or 200 years ago. So it's utterly flat. Against that background, I thought it might be fun to look at the ratio of we, indicating 
uh, people writing about and reading about a shared first person plural pronoun to the first person singular pronoun, the I. And this is this graph, when I first saw this, I was stunned because this graph, who knew that in ordinary books, um, you can see ordinary American literature. Remember, this is not academic books. These are cookbooks and, 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 and children's literature and so on. You see exactly the same pattern. It begins very low, people writing mostly about, I'm uh, sorry, this, this is the graph of that. And, and you can see a long, long trend that mirrors exactly the trends that we've been seeing in, in economics and politics and society. We have the next slide. Um, this is, shows the same trend, looking at the balance between rights and responsibilities, not in some absolute sense, but just in what, do, what are people writing about? And you can see at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, Americans were writing, relatively speaking, a lot about, about rights. But then um, beginning in, in uh, that long, what we're now calling the we period, increasing emphasis on, um, on responsibilities um, until we get to the peak again in the middle 60s. And in the middle 60s, suddenly people start writing about um, a, a sharp decline. Uh, they start writing much more about rights. It's sometimes called the rights revolution. It's true on the left and the right. And again, we can see this same basic pattern. Next slide. Um, I think this is one that I, I'm kind of proud of finding a quantitative measure of this. Another measure of individualism is the degree to which people, is how people name their babies. And um, in a period of, of um, individualism, people are looking for very unusual names. They want their kids to to stand out in a period of, of individualism, but in a period of conventionality, they don't want their kids to stand out. And this relies on uh, American national data on the frequency of different baby names. Higher here means people are giving their names, all their kids, all kids are getting named like John and Mary. Um, but when you get to the most recent, even in the earlier period, or in the later period, you see people are giving their kids rare names um, like Samantha or, um, or Jonah or Gideon. Uh, Gideon actually was an was a unusual name and, was, and yet was used a lot in the, in the beginning of the year and also in the, and my grand, one of my grandsons is named a Gideon. So once again, you would begin to see another quantitative measure of the degree of individualism in America or, or of, of uh, community in America. We have the next slide, I'm, I'm coming quickly to the end here. Now I've simply overlaid all of those, all those numbers are overlaid here. The, the trends in economic inequality, the trends in political polarization, the trends in social connectedness and the trends in individualism or community spirit. And you can see they're all identical. Each of those charts is actually known by people in a particular discipline but I think maybe we're the first people who've looked at how they all fit together. And uh, this statistically passes what statisticians sometimes jokingly call the interocular trauma test. It hits you between the eyes that there's something going on here. And um, that just to summarize now the whole empirical part of the book, we have the next slide. This trend puts all those charts together and shows the master chart of the book basically how Americans have, how American society has oscillated in a very long cycle, an inverted U cycle from over at the left-hand side, a very I society focused on individual needs and on economic uh, self-interest and on political uh, uh, polarization and social connections, uh, individuals not focused on social connections and so on. And that rose steadily. You can see that it in the in the middle 60s that turns, and suddenly we begin going down the other side of this graph. You might call this a pendulum, except as we'll say in a minute, we think pendulum is not the right metaphor, but that's what the data say. Um, Shannon, what what does that all mean if we start thinking in 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 um, uh, in, in practical terms, and how does it fit with the way in which American society has either treated or not treated um, our various minorities, women and, and, and minorities over this same period. Yeah, certainly. Um, can we go just back to that other slide for a moment? Um, thank you. 
um, certainly when we're talking about community, when we're talking about a sense of we, a sense of inclusion in American society, the first question, of course, is, well, how extensive or how fully inclusive was this we? Was it actually just a white male we that we were building toward in this first two thirds of the 20th century or was this a more inclusive we? When we stepped back to ask this question, you know, what we first encountered was a, a pretty common narrative in America and I think potentially beyond America as well about race relations in the 20th century. And that narrative, um, we've now seen this series of inverted U curves graphs. If we were to characterize sort of the common narrative about race relations over the 20th century in America, it would look a bit more like a hockey stick, um, a completely flat line indicating oppression, um, very little progress for black Americans until sort of the lightning bolt changes of the 1960s when uh, the civil rights movement and the civil rights acts passed and everything dramatically changed. And that's a very common perception, um, largely because at the beginning of the century, life was very bleak for African Americans. They had had significant gains during the reconstruction period shortly after the civil war, but then after reconstruction, um, the South engaged in what historians have called redemption, which was sort of the violent reclaiming of uh, white hegemony and white supremacy. And that turned into Jim Crow, which was a reality not only in the South, but also in the North and, and was a defining part of American society for this entire we period that we are describing. So is it actually true, this hockey stick story? Well, in many ways it is. In many ways, particularly when we talk about um, the longstanding lack of equity in black political representation in the you know sort of persistence of white supremacy in mainstream media um, the delayed entry into professional jobs and professional schooling for black americans um, as well as the persistence of residential segregation those measures look a lot like this sort of hockey stick where there was long delayed progress until um until the 1960s however when we looked at the at the long range data for um, material equality, uh, the shape of the curves looked quite different. If we can go to the next slide, we have here what um, a summary index of those material equality uh, measures look like. And now when we're talking about material equality, we're talking about things like life expectancy. We are talking about high school completion, degree completion um, for higher education. We are talking about um, income gains. We are talking about uh, the distribution of wealth between black and white Americans. And um, we're talking about home ownership. We're talking about voter registration. So these are very real measures that affect the day-to-day well-being of, of individual Americans. Now, if you look at this graph, you can see um, that at the top of the graph, we have 1.0, which would be approximate equality. It's very clear that we have not come anywhere close to actual equality between blacks and whites in America yet. However, it is surprising that when you look at that Jim Crow period, um, the first two thirds of the century, we see too slow, but nonetheless unmistakable decades long trend toward equality between black and white Americans on these measures of material equality. And then interestingly, when we get right to that 1960s, 1970 moment, that acceleration toward equality levels off. And in the book, we describe this as a sort of foot off the gas period in American history, when we were driving toward racial equality and then suddenly we stagnate. And in many cases of these measures that we're referring to, we see complete stagnation. And in some cases we see a reversal of progress from what we had seen in the previous period of American history. So that's a pretty shocking finding, especially considering that many Americans, particularly white Americans, believe that in the wake of the civil rights movement, everything just got better and better for black Americans. Um, and so there's a couple questions that this graph and this data provokes. The first is, how is it that blacks were moving toward parity with whites during the period of Jim Crow? Um, and how is it that, 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 I mean, of course, during this period, black, blacks and whites were experiencing upward mobility. But what this graph shows is that the rate of progress for black Americans was actually faster than white Americans. And how is, that, how is that happening? Well, the story here is something in American history called the Great Migration, which is one of the biggest demographic shifts that's ever occurred in America. It was when millions upon millions of black people took it upon themselves to leave 
the violent depression of the South to the more hospitable North. And they were able to participate much more in creating civil society organizations, attending school, getting access to healthcare. Now, again, they were doing this in separate spheres. This was still a highly racialized we. There was a black we and there was a white we. But, what, but it's important to note that black Americans were standing up in large numbers and claiming their place within the American we and experiencing um, upward mobility on all of these measures as a result. Um, and you know, it's important to note here that, that to what, what to white Americans are charts and graphs, to black Americans are the contours of their own genealogy. This is a very familiar story to black Americans. They don't need to be told about the black upward mobility during this wee period. Um, the, the autobiography that Michelle Obama wrote that um, was an international bestseller is the story of that great migration and the story of the change that happened for black families when they moved out of the South and into the West and North in America. So that's part of the explanation here. But the other question that this graph provokes is, what happened during this foot off the gas period when supposedly we had dismantled the legal um, segregation in this country? We, we ought to have seen a greater acceleration. Why did we not? Well, um, it so happens now that we've seen, you know, the multiple graphs that, that Bob has presented, this moment of stagnation corresponds almost exactly with the moment when America collectively flipped from a more we society into a more I society. And it's difficult to say, you know, which sort of came first, whether it's the racial realignment that sort of caused a more individualistic turn in America or whether it was the more individualistic turn that caused the backlash against the civil rights movement. But what we do know is that there was a very clear white backlash against the civil rights movement. Um, it, it's clear through the survey data that when you asked Americans if they were in favor of the civil rights acts, they said yes. But once it came time to implement some realignment in order to redress the segregation and redress the inequalities, um, during the, that first two thirds of the century, white Americans were not as willing to engage in desegregation, in busing, in all of the other things um, that needed to happen to bring about more equality. And that white backlash is a huge reason for this um, stagnation. And really the last point I'll make here about race is that um, it's against this backdrop, right? Of stillborn hopes of intergenerational stagnation that we see the Black Lives Matter movement happening in America today. And it's really important to note that Black Americans have been frustrated for a couple of generations with the promise of the civil rights movement not being fulfilled. And um, we'll come back to this, this, the lessons of this racial, um, this highly racialized we that we were building toward in America in just a moment. But let's go to the next slide and zoom back out again a bit to the broader story here. Because the question is, what do we learn from the American I, we, I century? Well, first of all, um, the, the problems that we're seeing in America are not just about declines. Within living memory, all of these declining measures were moving in the opposite direction, which prompts us to ask the question, what happened in that early 20th century moment when we pulled ourselves up and out of a situation that's very similar to what Americans find ourselves in today. It really, one of the core messages of our book is that Americans have been in a mess extremely, breathtakingly similar to what we see today. We've been there before and we successfully got ourselves out of it. And the question that Bob and I want to ask in this book is less what was going on during that peak of the we in America and how can we replicate it? That's actually not of interest to us, partly because that was a very imperfect we. It was a highly racialized we. Um, it also is, is not very instructive to look at the point when a trend culminates to find lessons. What we want to know is what lessons can we draw from the moment that the trend started. And so what we look at in the book is this moment when the Gilded Age, as Bob mentioned, gave way to the Progressive Era. The Progressive Era was a time in American history when a a dedicated group of reformers grabbed the reins of history and righted the ship. Um, they were, they experienced, a group of Americans experienced a compelling desire to repudiate this downward drift and a galvanizing belief in their power to do so. So let me quickly run through some of the lessons of this period. I know we're, we're over our time here, so I'll try to move quickly through this. What are some of the lessons of this progressive era, the strategic lessons that we might employ today if we wanted to produce another upswing? First of all, economics 
is not a leading indicator here. We're constantly asked, well, what's the leading indicator? What's the one thing, the silver bullet, that if we were to reproduce it today, we would see another upswing. Well, a lot of times people think that that would be economics. If we address the economic inequality first, perhaps the rest of these other measures like culture and polarization would come along with it. Well, it turns out that economics is a lagging indicator, not a leading indicator, which to us was surprising. And I think to a lot of social scientists will also be surprising that actually the, economic, the change in economic inequality came later. So what came sooner? Well, it's a little bit difficult to tell. Um, Finding a leading indicator here is nearly impossible given the extraordinary number of measures that we're looking at. But when you pair the data with the historical record, it becomes somewhat clear that a leading indicator was a moral and cultural shift. Many of the progressive reformers were experiencing a moral awakening. There was a clear, when you look at the intellectual history of this period, very early on, many people were calling for a realignment of America's values away from the social Darwinist mindset of winner take all, of uh, survival of the fittest being applied not only to the natural world, but this being an, a logic that should apply to society. That was a huge feature of the Gilded Age. It slowly gave way um, to something called the social gospel when um, evangelical Protestants in America came and said, you know, this is not the society that Jesus would have um, advocated. When we really look carefully at the gospels, we see a society that takes care of its vulnerable, a society that has responsibilities to one another. And they began to reorient the culture of America in a more we direction. That's a, so a moral awakening is a huge piece of this. Another huge piece of this is that this was a highly youth driven movement. The young people in the progressive era were living in a world as a result of the industrial revolution that was almost unrecognizable to their parents and grandparents. And they knew that they had to invent new ways to solve America's problems and they did. Most of the progressives that were leading this movement were under the age of 30 when they were doing their most important work. Um, so, so it was a highly youth driven movement. And as a result of, of it being youth driven, it was extremely innovative. Um, many of these young people had moved out of small towns and farms and into busy, isolated cities, and they had to invent new ways of bringing people together, invent new ways of being in a society that had fundamentally shifted. Um, and, and, and what these progressives did was they translated their moral outrage into citizen engagement. Uh, they reclaimed their individual agency in the face of drift and a dizzying complexity of their society and created solutions that really transcended a, a gridlocked left-right framework um, and, and, and became this sort of swell of bottom-up strategies. Um, it's important to note that when we talk about progressives in the progressive era in this period of American history, we're using the term somewhat differently than it is used to describe America today, Progressive is used to describe the left end of the political spectrum now. This progressive with a capital P era in American history was a highly bipartisan, extremely diverse movement, almost so diverse as to be incoherent, um, as some historians have noted. But it was all driven by this desire to repudiate the downward drift. And as those solutions bubbled up from below, we saw charismatic political leaders come in and create sort of the top down solutions to respond to that bottom up swell. And so one of the lessons here is that the charismatic political leadership really lagged. So those Americans today who are looking for a charismatic political leader, whether it's from the right or the left to come and solve all of our problems are likely looking in the wrong place. What we know is that no matter what the outcome of the election is in America, what, what we still need to do is that hard work of vast issues based coalition building of, of a proliferation of grassroots innovation that will actually create the upswell, the, the surge of citizen activity that will truly shift the course of our nation. That's what the historical record shows us. That's what the data shows us about what was happening during this previous period of American history. And the last po point that I will simply make here is that of course we know that the we that we were building toward during this first upswing was not a fully inclusive we. And as a result of that, in a way this we had knit into it the seeds of its own demise. The, the progressives who we are so lauding for being these citizen innovators were largely racist, not exclusively. We have other things that came out of this period like the NAACP, but largely these progressives did not extend their circle of moral concern to include people of color. 
And as a result, a lot of the systemic racism that we are now criticizing in America today was knit into the systems that these progressives created. And as a result, you know, we, we learn from this I, we, I century that we can be defined in more inclusive and exclusive terms. And that any upswing that we would want to see generated today in America must take inclusion as its primary concern. Any we that is not fully and entirely inclusive will once again fall victim to its own internal inconsistencies. And so if we can just go to the last slide here, um, a real summary of the lessons of the IWI century comes from a quote from Teddy Roosevelt, who was himself a progressive president. He said the fundamental rule of our national life in America, the rule which underlies all others is on a whole and in the long run, we shall go up or down together. That to us is the main lesson of the IWI century. It's the lesson for what lies ahead of us as America. And this is the message that we hope to share, not only with Americans, but with those looking anxiously on the American project and wondering where it will head in the future. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Bob and Shaylin, for that brilliant run through of the main arguments of the book. Um, some So much compressed into that time. Uh, brilliantly done. Thank you. Um, uh, so I'm not going to waste any time. We're going to go straight over to uh, Jennifer uh, Rubin. Jennifer, do you want to uh, give us your response? And I, I think you want to put it in a, a wider international context for us. Yes, thanks so much, Bobby. And thank you, Bob and Shay Lin, for that extraordinary work and for the, the fascinating trot through it. Um, I had the chance to, to go through it um, myself in a slightly slower pace uh, earlier, and um, it, it's just an amazing piece of work. So thank you for that and for the opportunity to discuss today. Um, one of the things that you say in the book is that you're not really seeking to, to explain uh, exactly what's happened as you just said, but, but actually to show us, I think very compellingly, um, the kind of the shape that the data forms across so many of these dimensions. Um, in my view, kind of much the way we can observe the, the draping or the movement of, of a fabric uh, as we begin to discern what lies beneath it in a sense. So it gives us that, that kind of picture of what's going on. In doing so, you're opening up so many avenues that to explore that um, obviously as a funder of social science, I, I'm very interested in and ESRC would, would love to uh, continue that work, I'm sure, over, over here um, and, and broaden it out. This wouldn't be the first time, of course, that Bob's work would have spawned and, and invigorated whole, whole new areas of work and Bob and Shailen working together, of course, um, on this. So um, the, the book ends with a, a series of rich stories of, of awakening, awareness, analysis, and action that contribute to the upswing um, to illustrate what happened and to learn from what happened uh, this century ago in, in the US. And, and I guess in, in the face of this incredibly rich terrain, I, I can only cover a couple of points. Um, and, and maybe I'll just draw on two from, from the last chapter, which would be really interesting, I think, to, to explore a bit further. Um, one of them is, is crucial throughout, and, and Shailen, you, you've just ended on it, and, and one is perhaps a little bit more um, implicit, mentioned, mentioned a few times, but, but crucially important, uh, in my view, I, I would argue, to how progress is made. So the first one, of course, is this emphasis on the importance of inclusion, um, and the point that with the tremendous social progress that was made, as you said, the we wasn't in inclusive enough, um, and that in, in any next upswing, we cannot compromise on equality and inclusion. And so um, that's a, a kind of a fascinating starting point for whatever goes next. Um, and you said that it sowed, sowed the seeds of the subsequent downturn. So I, I'd be really interested to hear more um, in, in the discussion, perhaps, about what this might look like, because um, so many of us are working so hard to work out how, how do we uh, become a more diverse and inclusive society? How do we improve on uh, equality when, as you say, so many of the kind of the legal barriers have, have been lifted? Um, it, it's just that, that that doesn't seem to be enough. And one of the ways that, um, that I've been trying to think about it, because as you say, people, people look for silver bullets, people want an answer or a level of analysis, which will give us some traction on it. And, and in my experience, both of, of research and of trying to act uh, to, to improve outcomes on equality and, and, and inclusion, it seems to me that, that there are at least three levels that, that we probably need to make progress, but it would be great to hear your views. And, and the first one is just kind of 
metaphorically opening the door, which I think you know a lot of lifting the legal restrictions does. It, it's sort of saying anyone can come in. Let's open the door. Um, but but the next one is really more about uh, needing to widen the door or even just rethink what the door is like at all, right? Because actually, you know, we, we've got all kinds of criteria for for different things in society, and unless we broaden those and and um, uh, value difference and so on, so, some people still aren't going to come through it, even if we open it uh, to everyone. But then I think there's a third level, which is in in many ways the hardest one to 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 get great traction on, partly for many of the reasons that that you illustrate in the book and, and also reflecting a lot of those um, is, the, is the one of, of actually figuring out what stops people getting to the door in the first place. And uh, as, as I was reading the book and thinking about that, I was uh, remembering um, in, in, in the previous book, um, Our Kids, uh, the metaphor that I remember Bob using in a talk, which was about how some people have their way up the hill kind of expedited and supported and others with every passing step, another brick is laid on their shoulders and made more difficult and more heavy to, to make progress. And so, um, I, you know, just that that's incredibly difficult and, and, and in, in some ways no amount of, of just social action or just changing rules is going to get at that and it would be really interesting to think about what good would look like in terms of making progress on this more inclusive we. Um, and then the second thing really, the, the sort of slightly less foregrounded bit in the book, but obviously it's, it's the actual toolbox that gives rise to an extraordinary book like this in the first place, is the kind of systematic, rigorous, empirical work that you've undertaken um, to help us understand the world around us and gain traction on what will help us improve outcomes. And so including diversity and inclusion, but and across a whole range of areas, we need to do so. And, and in the book you highlight, um, I'll, I'll just quote from it for a minute, that across sectoral divides, um, those, those who drove the upswing, quote, were intensely pro pragmatic, using the new methods of social science to test the merits of different solutions. Indeed, the innovation requires an openness to experimentation. So um, that, that was really inspiring, of course, as a person, kind of a pragmatic person in the world trying to, trying to figure out how can we improve outcomes, how can we use social science, which you know, I can fund or, or in a future role I'll be, I'll be using to try to improve outcomes. And it, I just, it would be great to hear what you think in terms of examples from the US where that's gone well, um, ways that we can actually kind of build that into how we work across sectors, across policy and research boundaries and, and so on. Um, as I was reading, I was thinking about what, what can we learn from other countries as well as the US and, and the UK, of course, where there are some great examples of, of that, that kind of rigorous empirical work informing outcomes. But um, I was reminded of, of uh, the work, some work that I did years ago in Finland um, where I learned about how they completely turned around many of their uh, many of their sort of services and, and public public services and systems, um, including, for example, their criminal justice system, where they just they made a very active decision to move from a much more punitive um, sort of Soviet model of criminal justice system to uh, a much more rehabilitative. Uh, Nordic model of, of, of criminal justice system, and they did so, so through systematic integration of evidence, identifying what was working, testing things, evaluating them, trying new things, and throughout, researchers and policymakers were in discussions and trying to really figure out what they needed to do, and, and that happened across a number of areas. So, um, I, I'd just be really interested to hear uh, on on both of those fronts because they seem like. Uh, one is, as you say, crucial to progress, and the other seems like a, a, a toolbox or a, a, a way of making some of that progress. Um, if there are things that, that you would like to come back with on that in terms of uh, getting to this next upswing. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Jennifer. That's great. Uh, Bob and Shailen, do you want to come back on that, those points? Um, let's get a bit of uh, response from you. That would be... I think you're muted, Bob. Uh, thanks, uh, Bobby, and uh, thanks, Jen. Um, I'm conscious of time, and I know that we all want to allow uh, many of the witnesses, mm. uh, the, the participants, to to um, pose questions too. So I want to just pick out one point in what Jen has said, and maybe Shailen will have others. And that is this role of social science and evidence in the progressive era. That is a deeply important point, Jen, as I think you appreciate, 
I'm going to talk about it actually in historical terms, although I'm happy to talk about it in contemporary terms as well. Um, first of all, that characteristic of the American progressive era, that they were really interested in looking scientifically at what was going on as a prelude, as a part of the process of reforming society. That comes originally from the UK, comes directly from England. And it comes from that late Victorian, Victorian era in which, and I, I'm not gonna to try now to name all the key figures of that in Britain, but um, those people were the creators of the first serious social science ever. And they did it in the context of looking to see what the facts were as a prelude to social reform. That's, that's, it's not just as it illustrates your point, it's the, it's, the, er, it's the initial example in the world, as far as I know, of a group of reformers beginning by trying to figure out exactly what the facts are and then leading and successful leading to social reforms. In the, U, in the US, frankly, we borrowed that model directly from, from the UK. Hmm. Um, and it's not an accident that most of the major social scientific organizations, the American Political Science Association, the American Economic Association, the American Sociological Association, the American, uh, I don't know, Anthropological Association, they were all founded exactly in that period. They were creations themselves of the, that is these social science organizations were the creation of the progressive reformers. So um, that is, in some sense, that's close to the core of this period that we're talking about. And of, I don't need to say that I think insofar as we can now begin to apply that, that lesson to our, our contemporary life, I'm not going to speak about Britain, but of course, all, all of you and many, probably many of your, uh, many of the viewers are themselves taking part in that problem in the UK. But in the US, what I can say is, and I, I think this will come as a surprise to no one in the world, um, we're at a low point nationally in respect for evidence and respect for science, including respect for social science. And we're not gonna turn this around in America. I'm now talking about contemporary American society. We're not gonna turn that around until we begin to develop nationally. And that's it's partly on us, that is the social scientists, to, to instill a sense of respect for evidence. You, until you get the evidence right, you, then, you really can't start talking. This is sort of one of the arguments we're making. You can't really start talking about should we do this program or that program unless it's rooted in serious social science? Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Shailene, anything to add? I do, we do want to get on to David and then. Uh, I'll, ju I'll just, I'll just try to uh, pull a few threads from what Bob said and address your other question quickly, Jennifer, which is that um, right along with that commitment to social science was also the commitment to the moral reformation. And it's actually illustrated in a single movement in that was a huge driver of the progressive era, the settlement house movement, which itself also was taken as a template from Britain. Uh, Toynbee Hall was the first settlement house in the world. And that inspired Jane Addams who founded Hull House in uh, Chicago. And one of the, the best, one of my favorite artifacts from the progressive era is these incredibly detailed neighborhood maps um, that the settlement Settlement house workers created. It was it was social science before social science existed, right? And um, but interestingly, the settlement houses were not just about gathering data and trying to have that data inform policy. They were also about creating moral formation experiences for the people who participated. Um, the progressives understood that we needed the science and we needed the evidence, but we also needed the heart work to bring people together. So this, this is a social the settlement house movement was not just about gathering data about parts of the city that reformers knew nothing about, but it was also about bringing elites into those parts of the city that they would never dare to go and developing relationships with people of different classes, people of different ethnicities. Jane Addams, one of my favorite quotes of hers is that we are under a moral obligation in choosing our experiences because it is our experiences that define our understanding of life. So it's not just the data, but it's also whether we're willing to engage in conversation and in relationship that provides the basis for the moral formation that will create this shift from we to I. And some of, the, some of these incredible movements of the progressive era married those two things together. They did not treat them as separate. They mm -hmm. were part of the same effort and that's what drove that upswing. That's excellent. Thank you, Shailene, that's a really important point. Um, so let's move on to David. Uh, Bob is right, we're getting lots of brilliant questions in. So if you do want to get some in, uh, please do that now. Uh, and I, we 
we'll try to get through them quick fire uh, after David's um, uh, contribution here. David. Well, thank you very much indeed, Bobby, for inviting me to participate. And it is a fantastic book. And uh, I find it a compelling narrative about a century of social and economic and cultural change in America. Uh, I guess it prompted with me two questions that I want to briefly focus on. Um, the first is, this is a book with American data, was there any parallel pattern in the UK? That, of course, is often what Bob, Bob's great work do. Then you immediately start thinking, what is the UK statistics on this? Is there a UK equivalent? And of course, our two countries are different. It doesn't follow that just because something has happened in the US, it automatically follows in the UK, but there may be some parallels. And the other question, which uh, he and Shailen wrestle with in the book at several points, is what actually happened in the 1960s? Why was there this big change in trends. And both of those have led me to look at something which they refer to in the book, which I want to focus on, namely the demographic underpinning of what we're talking about here. Uh, and if you move to the first slide, please, you'll just see the basic demographics of the US and the UK. Uh, and in the crudest form, just counting the number of babies born year by year, uh, through the last 100 years or more. Um, and I want particularly you to focus for both the US and the UK on the, the turquoise bit of the line, which is what in both of our countries we would call the baby boom. So you can see they don't have exactly the same shape. Uh, in the US, there was a sustained rise to a sort of high plateau in the mid 1950s, but the baby boom is essentially for both countries, a post-war phenomenon roughly from 1945 to 1965. In the UK, it has a slightly different shape with two peaks uh, immediately after the war in about 47, when we had more than a million babies born and a second peak in about 64, when we also had a million babies born. And between that, we never had lower than 800,000 babies born, uh, what has never uh, a high uh, a point that was a low point of the baby boom, but actually is higher than any subsequent British rate of birth. Now, if you think through, if you have a surge of babies born immediately after the Second World War, um, they enter their late teens and early 20s in the beginning of the 1960s. And I think part of the phenomenon that we're looking at here, this dramatic turning point, is the effects of a youth bulge. And there is quite a literature amongst demographers of the disruptive effects on the society of having a very large number of young people. Uh, young people, the, uh, the youthful surges preceded everything from the Russian Revolution of 1917 to the fall of the Shah after the Iran in Iran in, in, uh, the, in 1979, and most recently the Arab Spring. For any society to ride the, a surge of the number of young people going through their education system and then going out into the labor market is one of the biggest challenges that any society faces. It's both a macro challenge for society, it's also a micro challenge for individual communities. One of the most interesting analyses of the of antisocial behavior on housing estates, linked it to the changing ratio between the number of older people and the number of uh, young people on these estates and found that when the ratio went above a certain amount, then uh, disorder followed. So I think that what we saw in both countries in the 1960s was a surge in the number of young people that was inherently disruptive. And if you move to the next slide, you can see how uh, there is a clear peak in the number of young people, unusually high peaks in the numbers of young people, in particularly in the US, but to some extent in the UK, uh, at the points when uh, we have seen from this excellent book, there was a big change in culture, economics and society. Um, and I wonder if, in, if these young people, they were angry, they were frustrated, they didn't like the values of their parents, they were unhappy with the Vietnam War, uh, they didn't think that America was uh, inclusive enough. And 
And you can, it's much easier to resist those type of pressures if these young people are a small number than if there's a very large number of them indeed, especially in modern societies where being a big cohort has important, gives you a lot of power, both economic power in the marketplace and political power. Uh, what Bob and Shelin refer to in their book is the imprinting effects of events happening when people are particularly in their are sensitive to having their political and social attitudes shaped, which is when they're in their late teens and early 20s, attitudes which then stay with them for the rest of their lives. So the, the boomer, the young boomers who disrupted American society and to some extent British society in the 1960s, then kept those attitudes through their lives. And as a very large cohort still, those attitudes remain powerful even as they grow older. Um, now, I think in turn, this being a large cohort, having both been disrupted when they arrive, they then shape politics and markets around their preferences. It's why the Rolling Stones are still on tour, why you can buy uh, revamped versions of a Mini or a Volkswagen Beetle. Their, their patterns and their consumption, patterns of consumption are still important. And I would therefore just like to ask, to what extent what we are talking about here is the disruptive effects of a youth bulge combined with the, sus the sustained imprint of those experiences on a very large cohort as it works its way through society. A very stimulating book and I very much look forward to the discussion which should have been, as we've already heard from Bob also, a celebration of social science at its best. Thank you very much indeed. Well, thanks very much. Um, uh, I apparently, I guess you can hear me, but the host has, I see, uh, just a second, get my video started there, thanks. Um, and I can't do eye contact with Shailene, so I don't know what her reaction is. And, uh, but let me, let me respond very quickly. I'm conscious of the time, but I also think that what David is, the point that David has raised is a really important point. I'll respond to it as quickly as I can. First of all, yes, David, I agree completely. In fact, I remember sitting at a um, Stanford, a, 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 in the F Stanford Faculty Club in 1968, talking with a social scientist who made exactly the point that you're making. And he said, you know, we're in for a real um, brouhaha here because of all these, uh, the number of kids that are thronging our classrooms now. So that was, he was right and you're right. And it is an important, Part of the story, but it isn't the only part of the story, and I, I don't have time to go through this, of course. But I urge people to read the chapter on the '60s in our book, because America came. You can see this in the data too. America came into the '60s, um, moving in a very communitarian way, a very uh, worry about the society. Um, you know, kumbaya. The the music of that first half of the 1960s was very you know, um, warm and cuddly, uh, I want to hold your hand, is what the Beatles were singing. But then that turn, and we come out of the 60s, the second half of the 60s, in a much more individualistic direction. It's, it's a complicated story, which is why I'm not going to tell it here, but we do spend a chapter on it. But it's captured in the Beatles. The first part of the 60s, the Beatles were symbol, were, their music was symbolized by, um, by I want to hold your hand and a lot of other things like that. The last the last part of the 60s, the turning point is symbolized by um, the very last song that the Beatles recorded as a group. Remember, they were about to break up themselves as a group and become individuals. Um, here's the text, the entire lyrics of the last um, song they ever recorded together. I think it was by George Harrison, maybe, but I've forgotten just who it was. Um, uh, here are, the, here are the lyrics. I, me, mine. I, me, mine. I, me, mine. I, me, mine. That's it. And um, uh, six weeks later, John Lennon, who had gone off by himself alone, um, responded with a, in, with a song, I think it was called God, but I, I'm not going to get the exact words. Um, it, but the, 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 core, the, the core lyrics of that, of his song was... Um, I don't care about the Beatles, Beatles, I care about me. And that turning point 
from the first half of the 60s and the second half of the 60s is an extremely interesting point. And I think we need to add that, David, to the point you're making about the generational effects of a large baby boom. Because the boomers themselves turned out to be in adult, an adulthood, not we's, not, not advocates of we, but they were the leading, I want to say, I don't want to say cause, but the leading embodiment of America becoming a more I society. Excellent. Thank you, Bob. Jalen, anything to add on that or should we move? That's excellent. Great. So we've had brilliant questions come in and I'm going to try and uh, power through uh, some of them, uh, mostly for Bob and Shailen, but everyone welcome to contribute. I'd, I'll pick a, a mix of specific and, and general points, I think. So some themes within it. Um, there was a specific question about do does the decline in church membership that you showed include non-Christian um, religions? But I think it links to a couple of other points that people were making about uh, how relevant are is membership of civil organizations civil society organizations nowadays when we have more a movement based approach to engagement with people with me too black lives matters and environmental protests um so do we do we need to use caution in uh, using that as an indicator over time of a declining uh, we type of uh, mentality and, and then a sort of related one to that is if all if the traditional measures are going down what is going up um, are there things that are going up in society and is part of that new social movements and uh, new measures that people are taking to uh, achieve positive outcomes Brilliant. you want, you want to join in jump in i mean Sure, I'm trying to decide which of those <laughs> points to me, pull on let first. Take, um, let me take a, just a few of the data things. Um, sure. The, um, the answer to the question about religious membership is yes, it does take into account um, uh, non, non-Christian religious organizations, which are obviously much more important actually in the UK than they are in the US, but still even in the US, the answer is yes. Um, and um, the, I guess, I, but there's an important question about, well, how about social movements? And I, I, Shailen, I want to ask you to respond to that. But the other uh, really important question, which to which I devote in this recent work, actually, in it, this book is published simultaneously with a new 20th anniversary edition of Bowling Alone. And the only new chapter in Bowling Alone that needed to, needed to be written was, well, how about could, um, uh, could, um, Facebook or TikTok replace bowling leagues. That is to say, um, could social media replace the, the declining you know, face-to-face -face connections? And um, that itself is, a, is an interesting long story. The, and, and that's why we devoted, I devoted entirely, uh, probably 40 pages of the new edition of Bowling Alone to that topic. But I'll summarize it very briefly. The evidence actually it turns out is mixed. There is some evidence that social media can replace um, can replace old-fashioned organizations. By the way, keep in mind, social media um, had not did not exist when Bowling Alone was published. Um, Facebook was came into being six years after Bowling Alone was published. So, of course, Bowling Alone didn't talk about social media. They didn't exist, and no one knew they were going to exist. But now, in retrospect, we can say, well, was 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 the, the salvation were the cavalry riding to the riding to the salvation of America in the in the form of social media, and I just didn't notice the cavalry were coming. And I think the short answer, the three quick things I want to say: one, um, social the evidence of whether social media performs the same functions as face-to-face -face connections is very mixed. But I think if you had to guess, you had to summarize this simply scientifically. The answer is probably not. I'm not saying that social media are bad. That's a different question. But can they serve the same function? In terms of our health or our, you know, the other good things that we know that face-to-face -face connections do, um, it's it's very far from clear that the social media can replace them. But the but the more I think more interesting question uh, points are two that I want to make. See if I can make quickly. One is, it's a mistake to think of um, our lives as divided into or the options here are either face-to-face -face connections or uh, uh, virtual connections. Almost all of our networks now are mixtures. Mm at one time of both face, almost none of us have two separate lives and we have a life online and we have a life offline. Our lives for almost everybody are mixtures, different kinds of mixtures, but mixtures of face-to-face of, um, -face and, and, and virtual connections. And um, it's very much like um, 
in metallurgy an alloy. An alloy is a mixture of two um, base metals, like I never remember, but let's say tin and, and copper. You put them together and you get something else. I think it's bronze maybe. And the properties of bronze are completely different from either the face-to-face, -face, sorry, either the tin or the, or the copper. And, this, and, and therefore the mixture that we get of face-to-face -face and virtual connections you can't say that that's just somehow the mixture. It's, it has completely different properties. Um, Facebook is not just about face-to-face -face connections. I mean, just about uh, virtual connections, nor is it just about face-to-face -face connections. It's a new novel alloy. Mm -hmm. And last point I'll try to make quickly, but this is a point that we make also in the, in the upswing. We strongly feel that people have agency. All of us have agency. I mean, Shailen can make that point about the, the broader book. I can make it about, uh, I want to make it very briefly here, very briefly, to say the internet is not some force that's forcing us to be either individualistic or we can, we can control that. I guess this is in a some, some sense the most fundamental point we want to make. It seems to us that the history shows that we're not condemned by outside forces. We can make a difference. And that's certainly true in the area of the, of the internet. You can see ways in which when I say we, I mean, partly the folks on, in Silicon Valley who are making choices about what to create, but partly we consumers. If we use the internet mostly to sit dumbly in front of, you know, pictures of, of cats, well, that's going to make it one kind of, that's going to make the internet have one kind of effect. But if we use it, you know, to connect with people unlike us in our community, to change life in the community, that's going to be, and that's up to us, not technology doesn't determine that. Excellent. Thanks, Bob. Shelley. And I would follow on with that, that, you know, to the extent that social movements might be replacing religious participation or something like that, um, there's, there's, no, there's no real problem with that necessarily, except that if we choose to make our social movements entirely these online movements, or what we see in the statistics, which is that they're increasingly membership organizations where the only, you know, sort of function of membership is to write a check or to be on a mailing list. I mean, that is not the same experience as, as attending a church getting to know real people, helping engage in mutual aid for those people, you know, so social movements growing, they are missing that face-to-face -face interaction that not only produces social capital, which of course Bob's work has shown fuels all sorts of other things, but also um, doesn't give us that moral formation piece, right? Where we're actually, I mean, moral formation happens not just in hearing sermons, it happens in actually how you put those sermons into practice when you're engaging in mutual aid. And that's the piece that I don't think that the social movements we see today have as much. We also know from sociology of social movements that those that rely heavily on Twitter and on social media are extremely fragile mostly because they're lacking this face-to-face -face basis. The social movements in 2018 that we saw that were really successful in the United States were those ones that were engaging more in this alloy type of um, pairing the online interactions and the, and the mailing list growing and all this sorts of stuff with actual real on the ground door knocking and riding buses together to protests and things that actually built relationship. So whatever it is that we're, that's going to replace religious participation in America, it's got to be something that has a face-to-face -face component. And it's got to be something that helps us with a project of moral formation that orients us toward each other. You all often use the example, Shailen, that you know a lot about, I, I don't want to go on too long, of Tahir Square, which was a demonstration that didn't actually yeah. have, go ahead, you know the story better than well, I do. Well, yeah, David mentioned the Arab Spring. I mean, I happened to be living in Jordan and working with the, the youth of that youth bulge during the Arab Spring, right? And, and, you know, there was this great hope that something would change. But what I was seeing on the ground with these young people was that it was all happening on phones, mm -hmm. which is lovely to tear things down, but it isn't necessarily as effective when it comes time to replace it with something else. The, the relationships, the coalitions, um, the, the, the working out of the ideas of, of what's going to come and replace it was missing. And we saw that bear out in the Arab Spring in not every country, but in many of the countries, right? Yeah. And so, the, and, and the organizations that did have that social capital, that did have that face-to-face -face component were what? The military, right? And that's what came in in many of these countries to replace the, um, the organizations that were toppled. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a youth movement because those youth were not um, in, a, in a robust coalition that then could, could step in and, and build something new. Mm -hmm. Excellent, yeah, really good point. And 
moving towards a more international perspective, which is another theme that, that runs through groups of the questions. I'm just trying to, again, run together a couple, um, which is one is about, can we talk about this shift from I to we to I as a result of global development, uh, which can be observed in almost all cultures? Or do you think it's a process that's unique to the US? Um, and then related to that, why haven't we seen perhaps the degree of polarization, inequality, declining civic engagement um, in other Western countries, or at least some other Western countries like Sweden, Canada, uh, but others too. Is there, is there insights from the global drivers and the global outcomes that you've seen from, from the work that you've done? Well, I suppose I've had maybe more international experience, uh, Shailen. Um, of course, after I did Bowling Alone 20 years ago, that was the question that I was asked everywhere that I went, well, is it, is it, are we bowling alone in Britain or Sweden or whatever? And I always said, which was true, that I, I'm a data person and I use US data. And I didn't, on, I didn't have any claim to, to at all. I, I didn't make a claim that I was speaking about a global phenomenon. I claimed the data I had were about the US. Uh, historically, in that case, what happened was the initial reaction of a number of in a number of places, including the UK, was, well, that's an American problem. It's not true here. And I was willing to say, well, OK, it's, I believe in the data. Then with a lag of about five years, and this will be well known to all of you in, in the UK, suddenly people just said, oh, maybe it is happening here. And, and I'm not, so I'm trying to be a little agnostic um, because I, I believe in data and I only have, we only have US data. I am obviously aware of what's happening in other countries. Um, but I don't make a claim. And I think it's, I hope that, I mean, actually, I hope that, that uh, Jen and, and Bobby and David and others in your circles and other people listening in will try to see, is it true in the UK? I, just one last point. The fact that there are different, I recognize there, it, not every country is the same. For, and, and, you know, we're not all moving to one global, uh, you know, TikTok the, and, and all, you know, responding to one single, um, uh, you know, I forget the word for the music thing that keeps us all in time. We're not, we're not all on the same exact page. Of course not. But the fact that there are some similarities um, suggests that there may be something to this being, being true in other countries. But on the other hand, the fact that there are such differences across countries suggests to me that it can't be simply a result of some big single Nash global trend um, causing all of these things, because if it were a single national, if it were a single international trend, then we all ought to be showing exactly the same trends, and we're not. Hmm. Anything to add, Shailen, or shall I? Um, I yeah, I would I would be curious to learn actually from Jennifer and David more than I would to say anything more, but um, but I'll let you decide where to go here. Yeah, Jennifer, David, anything to add on that UK or international perspective? That's fine. Do you want to go, David? I'll just say very briefly that the on the economic stuff, which I am most familiar with, there are some quite strong uh, parallels between the US and the UK. Uh, for example, the surge in the value of wealth relative to incomes and GDP. Right. And going back to Bob's previous book, where he powerfully distinguished between the kids who'd got a high ed higher education participation and those who hadn't had that education opportunity, which were the sort of axes of, that, of the graphs in that fantastic book. Um, that kind of gap between graduates and non-graduates is also a feature of the UK. Right. Yeah. I have to say from my own kind of generational analysis perspective, which is um, looking at not as long a trend as, as Bob and Shailen have been putting together here, but definitely from the 70s. Uh, Bob's characterization on so many uh, different levels of cultural, social attitudes, that, that point about UK being following a similar path, but on a lag of a few years um, does seem to shine through in lots of ways, uh, not entirely. So we do have distinctive patterns within ours. And I think that, that understanding similarity and difference, why, we, why we're mirroring uh, following the path, but later, but not on everything, is a, is a crucial indicator, a crucial thing for us to explore about our own future in the UK. And I, I think that's that's what we, we're really looking forward to. So I'm, I'm just going to wrap up with a final kind of question um, about the future. Um, 
a group of questions about this really. And I remember Bob, when you first, when I first talked to you about the book um, uh, many months ago, uh, it was, uh, you, were, you were talking about how you, you may be seeing some signs of optimism, an indication of, uh, and that certainly comes through in the questions. Um, is there an indication in the data to show when and how an upswing uh, might happen. Is, is there any indication of uh, that coming through? And then I've got a kind of selfish addition to that, which is, um, well, there's one from uh, one of the uh, uh, audience about could climate change provide that uh, moral imperative? And then I think we can't uh, get through a session without thinking about COVID and um, its impact on our what Jeff Mulgan would call our social imagination in the UK about how do we do things differently and whether that may provide a spur. Um, and if you don't mind, I might come to Jennifer and David first, if they've got a reflection, any reflections, uh, so that you and Shailen, uh, Bob can uh, finish up on that. Is it David or Jennifer, have you got anything about indications of a hopeful future or how we might get there? Well, I, I think, I, well, of course, as you know, from your previous experience with Ipsos Mori, sometime, some of the trends on trust and actually, despite all the controversy around it, respect for experts and expertise are, if anything, increasing. And as we're also this week celebrating social science, um, evidence of people being more willing to follow data as so brilliantly collected in this book, and then in turn leading them to act, We've heard that was part of what the civic gospel was about 100 years ago. Um, yeah, and I do think that, that that has potential to help us today. Excellent. Jennifer, is there anything? Yeah, um, I, I would absolutely agree with David. I think we have seen a tremendous respect for what the data shows and, and letting it, if not tell us exactly what to do, help inform uh, you know, how we need to think about what we need to do um, th throughout the, the COVID pandemic in this country. And um, certainly as, for, as ESRC, we've been funding uh, research at, at great pace and, and uh, in high volumes uh, around things, including uh, there's uh, John Drury's project, for example, on facilitating the public response to COVID, harnessing group processes, understanding how we can use the pandemic or the, the kind of the coming together around helping people in the pandemic to understand uh, what we can do with that. And, and how that might help us in the future. So, so there's just you know the, there's a lot of um, the kind of uh, innovation that that Shailen, uh, talked about, I think, very eloquently. And uh, I don't think people stop to ask you know which side of a political spectrum or whether someone's a policymaker or a researcher when they're doing that. There, there are you know there's community activity and real jumping in. And I think to 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 the point about climate change as well, it you know has the potential to to really got to galvanize a, across uh, lots of different sectors and sector. So um, just a, a, a note of optimism, I guess, and what we can harness from from the pandemic. Brilliant. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, and yeah, uh, well then, Shailen. Well, uh, I'm going to say just a little bit, but then I want to go to Shailen uh, as well, and then maybe I, I, I can have a, a, a very one sentence wrap up. Um, we wrote this book because we wanted to persuade, especially American young people, um, to avoid cynicism and to be, we wanted them to believe that they could make a difference. And the role, the reason that we focused on the progressive era, rather than this, rather than the, you know, the, the, guilt, the golden age, as some people would look at it, the 50s and 60s, we didn't, we were not interested in that because we wanted to convince young people today that they were not trapped, that other Americans had faced similar situations. And we were, we didn't know how quite how soon that would happen, but that was our objective. Shane, why don't you pick up there? Because we we may or may not have different views. This is well, the events of the last the events of the last 48 hours, we're still processing too. But go ahead, Shane. <laughs> A uh, couple things came to mind. Uh, you know, I, I want to quickly address a couple of misconceptions about the book. One is um, that there that this these curves represent some sort of pendulum, right? That like we swing between community and then individualism, and then we sort of reach this apex of individualism, and and naturally things will then turn the other direction. Mm -hmm. um, just the day before the election, I was asked by a reporter, you know. Um, 
aren't we just at rock bottom here? These curves couldn't possibly go any lower, lower, right? So that means that like the only way forward is up. And I said, oh no, these curves can go a lot lower. I mean, we're on some of the polarization measures, we're, we're reaching almost the mathematical maximum, but on the inequality measures, we've not reached any sort of maximum on, on, the, on the cultural narcissism that could get a whole lot worse. You know, there is no moment in which this sort of just naturally and inevitably will turn back the other direction. That's point number one. Um, I, and I think the other, uh, the other misconception about the book is, um, is that, that, that there needs to be some sort of crisis in order for us to come together. We have this narrative in America, we look at the 20th century, oh, what brought us together was World War II. That was the moment when we finally found our common cause. And this, the data clearly show, the data clearly show that that trend happened way before World War II that this was a choice that the progressives made. There was no pandemic in the early part of the progressive era. There was no war. There was no crisis that compelled people to come together. It was a choice. And so on both of these misconceptions, we have this idea that something outside of ourselves is going to happen that's going to change things. And I think even when we look at the outcome of the American election, I think sometimes people think, oh, well, it's gonna be the president that comes along and finally makes a change. Well, that's just not the case. What we do know is that as Bob mentioned, agency is everything. What happens will be what we choose. And it may be that we have to sink a bit lower as a nation in America before we learn that lesson. I certainly hope not. And, and, and the, the question of climate change was brought up. I do believe that climate change is the ultimate we issue. You know, it's the issue that, that brings us all together because it is the issue that touches us all. And the sooner we realize that, the sooner we might find the issue that galvanizes us all into action. We're gonna argue a lot about how that, how that action is gonna look, but if we can find that um, common ground. And, and again, what encourages me is that young people today are not just encouraging action, they're encouraging action for moral reasons. That we've reached a point where it, there's, it is wrong for us to continue in the direction that we're going. The more that we hear that, the more that we respond to it, I think the more hope that we will see. Thank you, Shelley. Yeah, that's a, that's a really important clarification. Thank you. Um, I, can I just add uh, just a sentence or two? Because I agree with everything that Shailen said, of, of course. Um, in these days, especially for progressives like, like me, like us, um, it's easy to get pessimistic. Um, uh, you know, every, 10 minutes, it seems, we're learning about the ways in which, what are, how, what are the details of the election in ways in which we, we move in a more polarized direction, for sure. Um, but here's a case, actually, where I think a historical perspective is, is relevant and, and actually gives some, uh, some possibility of hope. We can actually see, even in this period, signs of maybe a gathering of some of the signs, for example, the, the youth movement that's obviously is not sufficient, but is beginning to gather force in, in America and maybe around the world. Um, and so even in the last 24 hours, when frankly I've been very depressed, very depressed in partisan terms, but also very depressed in, as, as an advocate of a more communitarian society, um, you have to keep your hands, you have to keep your mind focused on this long run pattern, not a pendulum, but one that we can change. And that's actually our main message, especially to kids in America, is do not be cynical. We've been here before. It took a long time before, but we were able, you were, people just like you were able to change America and we could, we could do it again. That's what gives me actually in the end optimistic. I don't want to just study up the world. I want to change the world a little bit like Marx is, uh, says on Marx's uh, tombstone out in, in Highgate Cemetery. I, I want to not just study the world. I want to help to change it. And, um, and that's the, looking at the history of this period gives me that kind of optimism, uh, optimism that maybe we can change it. Thanks very Brilliant. much. For you. Brilliant. Brilliant way to end. So I think two words of hope and agency um, coming through there at the end that they said we should have hope and we can affect change so that's a brilliant brilliant point to wrap up so we have to stop there um, uh, all that remains for me to do is to thank first of all Sage Publishing for their excellent help in putting on this event um, the team at the Campaign for Social Science uh, for organising it um, and the universities and learned societies that support the campaign and of course uh, ESRC's Festival of Social Science um, 
Uh, and then finally, of course, to thank our excellent respondents in David and Jennifer, uh, great points uh, really added to the discussion. And very finally, of course, uh, the authors, Bob and Shay Lin. Um, uh, all I've got left to do is to urge you to go out and buy the book or borrow the book, uh, but just read the book in the end. Uh, everyone uh, get your copy of The Upswing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Thanks. Thank you. This has been fun. Bye.